right across the road, there's a logging gate. Two different loggers, both these individuals had seen what they would describe as a Sasquatch or Sasquatch family walking past this gate at around three o'clock in the morning. I put a game camera on the back of the bumper of my travel trailer, and then I put another one on my wheel well for about two weeks. I got the, these two does that would come in onto the property every day. I would get a coyote occasionally. I'd get a raccoon. The usual suspects, I would, I would get them almost daily. The same, same species, same animals, day in and day out. It was about two o'clock in the morning on, you know, two and a half weeks in uh, that my wife woke me up. We're in our travel trailer. She goes, hey, there's something outside messing with our cooler. So I said, oh, shoot, I bet you it's a black bear. Well, I get up the next morning and I'm curious as to what was captured on my, my cameras. The one on the wheel well had been triggered, but it didn't capture anything. And then I reviewed the one that was on the back of the bumper of the travel trailer. I see a, a, uh, a flash, something walk right by it. You know, I'm about 180, just under six feet. Wherever this was, was much bigger than me. The really interesting thing to me is this. After I walked past my camera for the next two weeks, I didn't get nothing. No animals were coming into that area. Everything vacated. There was nothing. I'd left my cameras out there hoping I'd get better footage, better video, nothing. I didn't get any animals. But after about two weeks, that's when I started getting the does back, the raccoon, the, the coyote, and a, a possum. To me, that they kind of painted a picture in my mind that maybe there was an, you know, if it was Sasquatch or not, it was apex predator in that area that chased everything off. I'd like to welcome Mr. Shane Corson to Bigfoot Crossroads. Shane, man, this is kind of crazy to me that this is sort of the first time that we're really getting to talk voice to voice. I think it's happened one other time in the past, you know, on like a, that Apple Hangout thing that they did for a little while. But uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing really good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, uh, I know you're one of the most longstanding podcasts out there, so it's a pleasure being here, but I'm doing well. Thank you. Just to kind of catch everybody up to speed uh, with your background and everything, so how did you get from uh, Scotland, if I'm not mistaken, to the Olympic Project? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I moved over here from Scotland in 93. Um, it wasn't until about 97 um, have been been very interested in the Sasquatch phenomenon that I, you know, 97, I, I graduated high school. I got, you know, I had wheels by then. So I started traveling around Northern California, Southern California, eventually, you know, doing a little bit of research down there or what I called research at the time. And then I uh, met my wife and moved up to Oregon in 2008 and continued my passion for looking into the phenomenon. Um, and then eventually, um, you know, around 2012 is when I met Derek Randalls of the Olympic Project. Went on one of his public expeditions and um, up, up in the Olympics uh, at the, the OP property. And we just hit it off right off the bat, became friends. He uh, asked me to, you know, uh, since we're so like-minded and we're passionate about the outdoors and hiking, and we had the same kind of ideas and goals. Um, he asked me to be a, a part of the Olympic project. And that's basically, um, you know, I've, I've been, I'm, I'm actually pretty much, um, well, I'm a co-runner of the Olympic project right now alongside Derek and David Ellis and, and a few others. So, uh, that's how I basically, uh, you know, jumping on an expedition with Derek and enjoying what they were, you know, the Olympic project was doing, going about their, their research. Um, I was, I was rather taken back. Um, uh, and so, I was very, uh, very happy to be brought on onto the Olympic project back then. Was that your first like foray into the field looking for Bigfoot? Was that trip? No, no. I, you know, I, I, when I was in Southern California, I lived out of, uh, I lived out of San Diego, East County, San Diego. And, uh, you know, I, like I said before, I, I, I would venture out to places like the San Bernardinos, um, the Cleveland national forest areas like Palomar mountain, Ida wild, um, 
And eventually I started heading north uh, towards places like the Sierras and, and Yosemite, which Yosemite was one of my absolute and still is favorite spots to go. Uh, I spent a lot of time out there hiking, exploring, backpacking, and never really came across anything of significance, a lot of bear. But uh, 2008, when I moved up to Oregon, I continued on getting out to the woods, exploring, especially around the Mount Hood um, National Forest, that area, and then also a little bit later on, uh, the Tillamook um, Forest, which is on closer to the coast of Oregon. Um, but as far as, you know, and I was basically running solo. I didn't know anybody. Uh, I didn't go out with groups. I didn't correspond with anybody. Uh, 2008, I think that's kind of when Facebook really started. And I started reaching out to, you know, all these groups were forming, Bigfoot groups, and I uh, started reaching out and asking questions and sharing some of my ideas. And uh, 2012, those, you know, uh, when I went on that uh, public expedition, it's when I actually got to meet some of the people I've heard about, like Derek Randalls and David Ellis and, and, and Cliff Berkman and those guys. It's when I got to kind of know them. And so as far as uh, group outings or a um, team effort, that was my first foray into that. But I had been doing stuff solo for quite a while. We have a mutual friend, Todd Hill. He's been on the show. Uh, and he kind of had a similar story about how he kind of got involved in the Bigfoot community and everything. And it just, you know, it, it's kind of, to me, it's a big deal. Like, <laughs> you guys just both, like, the names you're, like, rattling off on your, like, first, you know, real Bigfoot outing with a group and everything is just kind of crazy. Uh, you know, where those people are at now and how they're viewed and everything. And, you know, you're definitely kind of within that same group. Those are now peers. Are you, are you ever kind of taken back by the fact that, you know, some of those big names in the Bigfoot world that you talked to at one point on Facebook, now those are your peers and comrades? Absolutely. I mean, great point. No, I, you know, I remember when I was growing up in Scotland, um, you know, I, I read about the Patterson Gimlin film and watched the film itself and never in my wildest dreams did I know that one day I'd be hanging out with Bob Gimlin and call him a friend. And, you know, as an example, but, you know, ha, you know, Todd Hill's another great example uh, of a guy that was doing research in Southern California and California in general. And, uh, Never in my, I just didn't know anybody that was doing that down there. You know, I, I, I read about stuff, you know, right. historical stuff, but you know, and so now here, Todd Hale and I are now both part of the Lent project and, and, uh, getting to you know Derek Randall's and, uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, um, uh, you know, the late John, Dr. John Binnernagel, all these guys that I had read about and watched on films and flicks and to, to be able to get out in the field with them or be in their person. Um, it was, it's still, it still to this day, it shocks me, you know, uh, how, from where I came from to, to where I'm at now. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's an amazing thing, you know, and I, I don't want to uh, overplay names or anything, you know, I mean, all these individuals, you know, uh, are, are wonderful people, great researchers, uh, you know, and, and I got it, my hats off to people like Dr. Jeff Meldrum and, and those, those in academia that I get to call friend, get to correspond with and have met and, and run ideas by, it's an absolutely stunning thing to me uh, to the point where I just, sometimes it's, it's not overwhelming, but it's just, I'm kind of, kind of in awe of how everything's transpired over the years. And I, I don't take any of that for granted. Uh, it's, it's a special thing. Uh, I think the whole personal aspect gets lost a lot uh, you know people like to hear the bigfoot stories and then on the internet there's a lot of focus on you know well what's the research and you know show me your evidence and things like that but we forget that at the end of the day we're all people and that like you know it's just kind of weird uh this past week i've been reflecting on a lot of things involving like bigfoot research as a social community and like how it's evolved over the years as to like the directions that it's led and everything. And just thinking back on some of my own, you know, relationships with different people and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of crazy, you know, like I grew up reading books 
uh, on the subject. And a lot of those books, you know, were by Lauren Coleman. Yeah. And then like eventually it got to the point where I'm like, you know, sliding in Lauren Coleman's DMs, and, like <laughs> talking to him. And it's just like, man, this is crazy. Uh, you know, there's not too many communities in the world where you can like do that and experience that. And it's just kind of, I, I just wanted to get your take on it because I mean, you're out there with some heavy hitters on the Pacific Northwest area. Uh, and it's just something that, like I said, oftentimes I think gets forgotten about and overlooked. I mean, calling Bob Gimlin your friend, you know, <laughs> like he he's part of uh, the biggest historical piece of Bigfoot ever. Yeah. And he's just also a guy at the end of the day, just, just a dude. No, well said. Well said. You know, uh, it's uh, no, I, absolutely well said. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, what I love about a lot of these people is they don't have an ego. Is it, if you have an ego in this field, then I, I really, I, I really don't want anything to do with you. You know, because uh, I sure as heck don't. I'm just an average guy trying to do it, you know, trying to study something extraordinary. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why I surround myself with people with no egos and uh, they're in it for the right reasons, have the same goals, same agenda, same ideas. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's so fascinating, extraordinary that, you know, I'm very blessed in the fact that I can do that with some of the biggest names. And then, of course, there's a lot of people that don't, don't, uh, they're not you know, uh, public, uh, that don't want to be out there in, 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 in the public eye. And, um, they're, they're amazing individuals, but they're just solid grounded individuals. And that's, that's what I love about the subject matter, you know, cause I can do it when I want to do it and how I want to do it. Um, there's no rules and there's no guidelines, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's a true, it's a, you know, it's an absolute passion. It's an absolute passion and a fun one. What's going on with the nest site? I I haven't heard anything about the nest site uh, in a, in a while. A few things after Todd was on the show, uh, I know a couple rumblings, and we'll get onto that. But any advances? Uh, is it still ongoing? What's what's the deal? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's 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 practically the reason I moved up to Washington State from Oregon because when we were introduced to these, uh, we did not find these nests. They were introduced to us as most people know, um, through a, a timber surveyor and eventually the owner of the property. But it's definitely, um, it's definitely ongoing. You know, I mean, the nests, I mean, themselves are long degraded. Uh, even the new one that Todd Hill and I came across back in 2020, it's, I mean, there's nothing left. Nature takes over rather quickly. Um, between, you know, the animals and then just the environment and the weather. Uh, but we're constantly in this area. It's probably, it, it is definitely our main focus area. It's a big area. Um, and so we're constantly monitoring it. We're camping out there. The, the main thing we've been up to in this area as of late, is just um, placing long-term audio units, um, out there, um, SM4s, which is a professional bioacoustical, very expensive uh, recording device that the you know professional biologists use to place in in areas to record everything from bats to birds and, and known animal life. And so Chris Spencer has taken the helm at uh, purchasing a few of these. Uh, I think he's now got three of them, if I'm not mistaken, and we have a couple of them and and, and some other. Um, long-term audio devices that are, are a lot cheaper, um, much easier to put together and leave out, but they record up upwards of, you know, two to three months, you know, very non-intrusive. And so we've, uh, for the last two years have been going out and placing these recorders out there, leaving them and then servicing them. And by servicing them, I mean, going back and changing batteries and SD cards and then keeping them running. And so for the last two years, that's what we've done recording every single night, for the past two years, um, you know, basically evening till dawn and documenting every, uh, everything, uh, every known animal. And then uh, occasionally we get some of these unknowns, as we call them, or suspect sounds that, you know, we, we possibly attribute to Sasquatch, uh, whether it's percussives or long howls or whoops or whistles or, uh, or movements uh, very close to the recorder, especially if it's bipedal. Uh, but we documented and we have, uh, we, you know, with the help of Squatcher Metrics, 
Um, you can find Squatcher Metrics on Instagram and, and on Facebook. Um, uh, he's a statistical analysis uh, expert by trade. That's what he does um, within um, the soccer world or football, as they call it in Europe, because he's European, he's English. And so he, uh, we would send, uh, you know, Chris would um, vet the audio visually through a spectrogram, you know, bring the audio back, the SD cards, review the audio, which is very, very tedious, and record everything from coyotes to ravens to um, a bear to elk, deer, you name it. Everything was, re, you know, jotted down and categorized in spreadsheets. And the spreadsheets were put together by Squatcher Metrics. And uh, that's one of the most exciting things I think we've done. I don't know if anybody's done that before, um, you know, basically recorded every single night for two years. And it really, um, it, it was a really fascinating study. We're still recording in this area. We're still cataloging stuff. We're kind of done with the um, spreadsheet thing at the moment. I think we got a good idea of what's possibly going on in this area at times and what's not going on. But it is, it is, it is one of those things where, you know, by documenting everything in this area, you know, uh, over and over again and getting really, really familiar with the known animals that when you have something that jumps out as a suspect sound, and like I said before, whether that's a vocal or, or percussive, but such as a knock, um, it, it actually is pretty amazing that uh, I used to think in my head that if Sasquatch is in this area, this particular area, that, you know, they weren't around all the time. They are probably coming through here and there. But it's quite possible that they're there a lot more than I ever thought. And, that didn't, and that's just based on the audio. And that kind of, uh, that kind of blew my mind. So um, that's one of the things we've been doing. I mean, obviously we're scouting this area. It's just, it's so thick. Uh, the huckleberry in this area, the evergreen huckleberry in this area is so thick and so tall. Um, you know, you could, you can't see but a few feet in front of you in many cases. Uh, we do most of our exploring off trail, um, you know, and we kind of take a little break. Uh, well, recently, because the the uh, ground hornets and the wasps <laughs> and the bald faced hornets they they've been atrocious. I've been stung thirty times this year at least. Jeez! And so, getting off trail is um, it's brutal. And so, we had to take a break. It got a little dangerous. Uh, obviously, we got mountain lion in this area. We have bet black bear, um, and then we got ticks and whatnot. The usual suspects, uh, but it was the the smallest little suckers. Those little wasps that were keeping us out of there, not the bear or the cougar. <laughs> it was the wasps. And so we, uh, you know, you have to take a break. This year they've been horrible. I don't know why, but they've been absolutely atrocious. Uh, so um, exploring, we did a lot of camping on the outskirts of this area, but not so much exploring because of the, the hornet factor, the wasp factor. Um, but we've had, you know, made a, a few interesting discoveries, I think, this year that tie in with some of our ideas uh, and thoughts as to what may be going on in this area. You know, so, uh, and that's both tracks and, uh, you know, not just recording vocals and stuff like that, but seeing that in person or hearing that in person. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's, we're, we're, it's ongoing, you know, it's one of the about three areas we, we kind of, uh, we, we've honed in, in on over the years. We don't, uh, we don't really ambulance chase, you know, uh, and you know, there's, a, there's a, everybody has their purpose. You know, I know a lot of groups out there and individuals will, you know, go after a, a recent report or whatnot, but, uh, we really focus in on about three different areas that we traverse. Um, one is, well, two of them are in the Olympics and then one's in Southwestern Washington. Uh, we really, our goal is to get to know these areas, get to know the, the, the weather patterns, the terrain, the animal life. And, uh, and record nonstop, um, you know, and so on top of that, our next step forward is uh, I think we have quite a portfolio sp specifically speaking in the nest area. Uh, the one thing we, we lack is um, actual video footage, whether that's uh, in the nest area specifically, if that's, uh, you know, game camera work or, you know, a camcorder or what we really been focusing on lately, having obtained some new equipment, is thermal. Uh, we really would like to get something on therm, um, you know, to, you know, uh, to add to our portfolio so that we don't just have, you know, 
hand impressions and, and foot impressions and hair and these, you know, these nests and uh, everything else that goes with that. We, in audio, we want to get something on camera and that's where we've actually really been focusing our time uh, experimenting, coming up with ideas on how to possibly get a Sasquatch in this particular area on, on camera, on therm. I recently uh, received an email. I had uh, contributed to the Kickstarter fund for Legend Meets Science 2. And uh, in this email, it was just kind of an update to let everybody that contributed know what's going on. It mentioned uh, the nest site and the Olympic project. Uh, can you talk at all about any of that contribution or anything? Yeah, I'm not signed to NDA, so I guess I'm a good go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's a relief. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we uh, just actually just recently within the last month, we uh, sat down and did an interview with uh, Doug Hycheck and some of his uh, cameramen, and we basically go through um, a lot of the nest material, uh, the stuff discovered, uh, and so that will be included in that documentary to what extent. I don't know. I don't have the, the know or the editing and all that um, know-how, but um, yeah, we will be a part of that uh, as will many others. Um, you know, uh, it's uh, one of those things where I know, and, and thank you for everybody that contributed because uh, Doug Hycheck uh, is just an amazing guy. He's done so many amazing things over the year. He's such an entrepreneur and forward thinker. Um, I contributed myself because I believe in this, I, you know, in in what he's putting together here. So I'm excited about the, when all said and done, and it's actually available for public consumption. Um, I'm excited about that, but we definitely, you know, play a, a small role in this upcoming documentary. Um, you know, and I know I've got more material to send, you know, other than the interview itself, I have a lot of material to send uh, to Doug Hycheck himself that he may or may not use in, in the process, in the, in the film. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think, it, I honestly think it's going to be one of the best productions on the subject out there that's been done. It's going to, it's going to include so much information from multiple sources from around the country, including even Doug, Doug Hycheck's personal stuff that he's been working on, let alone, um, you know, active researchers and witnesses and stuff. So it's, I'm not, I'm really excited about, uh, you know, where this may go. Yeah. I talked to Doug not too long ago. I was part of an, another podcast, uh, that he was a guest on and I got to participate in the interview. Yeah. Legend meets science too is going to be a major, major documentary release. Uh, I thought legend meets science one was a uh, really good and, filmmaking and information and technology and so many things have advanced since it was released. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this production. Doug is an amazing, uh, filmmaker. And like you said, inventor, entrepreneur, everything. He's, he's a good guy to have on our side for sure. Oh, he's an absolute attribute. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I I can't, I can't speak highly of Doug Hycheck. I mean, just an amazing guy that, um, that, you know, uh, sticks at it. He sticks at it. He does, you know, uh, I mean, look at monster quest, the series he, he helped put together. And, and I mean, what an amazing series that was. I missed, I missed the monster quest series. It was oh, one yeah. of my favorites. And yeah, I mean, just a <laughs> fantastic series. I mean, really it's, there's so much garbage on TV now, uh, even in this phenomenon and outwards, uh, that was really pretty solid. It was great. Uh, well produced. Yeah. Um, the first uh, Legend Meets Science was fantastic. This one I have really high hopes for because I know Doug, he always ups the ante and he always uh, learns from either past mistakes or just builds upon his success. And he's done a wonderful job, I think, at uh, you know w what he's up to now in encapsulating the whole phenomena from multiple areas and, and within you know multiple people and uh, this is, this is going to be, you know, I got high hopes for, it. I think it's gonna be really exciting. It's gonna be something new, something refreshing, but also something people are maybe a little more familiar with, you know, that, that, that'll resonate with them and, and hopefully, uh, you know, bring some conversation again to this table. 
Speaking of conversation on the table, Todd mentioned to me a trail cam attached to the back of an RV. Oh, that got something interesting. Could, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, it's funny, Todd. Uh, he's a he's a funny guy. But yeah, yeah. Um, um, so when I moved up to Washington in 2017, I was waiting for my house to foreclose. And as so I couldn't move in, I had sold my previous house down in Oregon. And a, a friend, a mutual friend, a limb project member, James Milling, had a really pristine remote piece of property fairly close to, I mean, fairly close to the nest area within 10 miles. And he had offered this property to me. He said, Hey, you know, while you're waiting for your house to foreclose, I mean, there's no power or anything. It's remote. You have a travel trailer. You're, you know, you have a generator. You're more than welcome to stay on this property, um, you know, as you're waiting to move into your house. And he had told me, uh, this property is pretty awesome, not just for the abundance of wildlife, but right across the road, there's a logging gate. And this logging gate, um, you know, literally it says it was literally about a stone's throw away. I mean, I probably couldn't toss a, a rock that far, but it was about maybe 50 yards away, maybe 60 yards away from where I was camping. And um, two different loggers, uh, long haul uh, loggers that would haul the logging, uh, the logs out of these areas within a span of about a month and a half. They didn't know each other. But each, both these individuals had seen what they would describe as a Sasquatch or Sasquatch family. Um, they both saw four individuals walking past this gate at around three o'clock in the morning. These long haul drivers would park outside the gate and wait for somebody to open it. And they would park there. And two individuals had seen uh, four different Sasquatch, uh, a larger one, a smaller one, and then two smaller ones, almost like a, um, and they didn't, I don't, they never said it was male, female, blah, blah, blah. Just that there were two bigger ones and two smaller ones, almost like a, a male, a female, and two juveniles, so to speak. Um, so I was very excited about camping on this property and I thought, well, shoot, I got a, about three weeks, you know, uh, two weeks. Uh, we ended up spending about a total, I think about a month out there. Um, so what I had done is I parked my travel trailer on the property and, um, you know, set up my camp and whatnot. And for the, what I would do is I put a game camera on the back of the bumper of my travel trailer. And then I put another one on my wheel well. So I had one on the side of my travel trailer and one on the back of my travel trailer. And, um, for about, you know, two weeks, I was getting the same. I got the, these two does that would come in onto the property every day, just about, and they would forge around early morning hours. And they would leave. I would get a coyote occasionally. I'd get a raccoon. Um, the usual suspects, I would, I would get them almost daily. The same, same species, same animals, day in and day out. Well, about two weeks into this, almost three weeks into, the, into this area, because I would review my camera maybe every day or every couple of days. But um, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning on, you know, two and a half weeks in, uh, that my wife woke me up. We're in our travel trailer, um, with my daughter, Nevaeh, who, you know, at that time was quite young. Um, and we're sleeping and my wife was, woke me up, shook me up and she goes, Hey, there's something outside messing with our cooler. And I went, Oh shoot. You know, I usually, I, I would lift my cooler up and put it in the back of my truck. I don't have a large travel trailer. It's about 24 foot, not, not a huge travel trailer. So there's really no, there's room in my travel trailer for the cooler, but I would usually leave it outside during the day and then put it in the back of my truck um, before I went to bed. That night, I had not. I left it out. And I thought to myself, I didn't hear what she was hearing. She said she heard something messing with it. She could hear the ice swish in it. So I said, oh, shoot, I bet you it's a black bear. So I got up. And I opened up the, the door of our travel trailer, and I looked around. We had, a, we had a light, just a little light on the side of the travel trailer. It wasn't very bright. But I looked around, and I looked at the, the cooler, and it looked like something had messed with it. Um, like it was just shoved to the side a little bit further than where I had placed it. So I'm looking around, and I don't see anything. So quite honestly, it was cold, and I just wanted to go back to bed. I was tired. So I said, I went back to bed, and I said, if it comes back, I'll, I'll chase it off. It's probably a black bear. 
Anyways, go to bed and nothing help nothing else happens. Well, I get up the next morning and I'm curious as to what was captured on my my cameras. You know, see if I got a black bear or whatever have you. And I I go to the wheel well and grab the one off of that and I grab the one off the back of the bumper and I bring them inside and I have my laptop set up and I put the SD card in there from the one on the wheel well. Well, the one on the wheel well had been triggered, but it didn't capture anything. So something had triggered it, but didn't capture anything, and, which is not surprising. You know, uh, I think the trigger speed on that was pretty slow. Um, so if something moved across it briskly or fastly, probably wouldn't have captured it. It would have triggered it, but not captured it. So I review that and there's nothing on there. And then I reviewed the one that was on the back of the bumper of the travel trailer. And I'm going through the videos and I'm watching this video. And so once again, something had triggered this camera and it's just running video. I had them both set on video, not pictures. The one on the bumper was running. So something had triggered it. I'm like, Oh, something must have been home, but maybe a black bear just making a lap around the travel trailer. and I just didn't capture it. Well, as I'm viewing this video, uh, the one on the bumper, as it was already running, I see a, a, a flash, um, something walk right by it um, that looks bipedal. It's very close. The, the camera on the back bumper was a wild game innovations camera. It was an older one. Um, no sound. Something had triggered it, but then something had walked right in front of it, and it was large. It looked bipedal. Uh, it looks like you can see an arm swinging. And uh, you could possibly make out hair, but uh, it was it was so close to the camera. Had it been maybe four, you know three or four feet further back, I probably would have got more detail and less flash because the the light hit this this individual this thing right. that it just looked like a solid white thing. But it 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 looks bipedal. You know, I've never put it out there for public consumption because I don't think it's good enough. Right. Um, I have I have gone back and done. Literally, I'm, this is no joke. I've gone out there naked and walked in front of this thing briskly. I've put clothes on, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm about, oh shoot, I'm about 180 in, in poundage, uh, about uh, just just under six feet, five eleven. Um, wherever this was was much bigger than me, and by pedal, and there was there's a frame when it's walking that, it, it, you know, at the time I didn't know it was an arm. Uh, it, it almost looked triangular, like you got an arm and then it comes to a point. Well, it was walking or moving so fast. I experimented on this and I, I, I figured it out. When it swung its arm, it's just the way it was pixelated and captured. That it looks like it's got like a, comes to a point. But I did the same thing. I'm just much smaller. I'm much smaller in size. And so, long story short, was that a Sasquatch? I don't know. I don't know. It just, it was something bipedal, something with an arm. And probably messing with my cooler. Now, the really interesting thing to me is this. I, for you know, like prior to that, for two weeks, I was getting the same does in the area. I was getting the same, you know, uh, raccoon. Uh, there was two different raccoons, the same ones. I get occasional coyote and, and rabbits, and you know what. But after that thing walked through that frame, after it walked past my camera for the next two weeks, I didn't get nothing. No animals were coming into that area. Everything vacated. There was nothing. I'd left my cameras out there hoping I'd get better footage, better video. Nothing. I didn't get any animals. Wow. But after about two weeks, that's when I started getting the does back, the raccoon, the, the coyote, and a, a possum. So to me, that they kind of painted a picture in my mind that maybe there was an, you know, if it was Sasquatch or not, it was apex, pre apex predator in that area that chased everything off. And so I tied that in with also the loggers that possibly saw, you know, these four Sasquatch, you know, month apart, um, that they knew each other. And so, um, as, as a caveat or not a caveat to that, but something I thought about in my brain was that, you know, those cameras were placed on my vehicle you know, on my travel trailer. They weren't on a tree. They weren't standing out. They looked like they were a part of this human contraption. Right. Um, I don't know if there's something to that, just an idea, you know, just an idea, but, you know, I don't know. Is it a Sasquatch? I don't know. It's bipedal. Um, you know, uh, some people claim they can kind of see hair on, on the video. I don't know. It's just, I don't know if I read that far into it. It's looks like maybe there's hair, but it's so dang close to the camera and it's whitewashed. 
because of the flash. You know, if I had a really expensive camera, maybe it would have turned out better. Maybe I would have had, you know, like the cameras I own now, they have audio. They have audio and they, they're much better. But um, that's just what I was dealing with back then. I always tell people, you know, when you're camping and you want to place cameras out, you know, put them on your, put them next to your tent, put them on your vehicle. And, you know, maybe if Sasquatch is around, possibly maybe they'll, they won't get too weirded out if they do decide to approach you. They'll just assume that's a part of your, uh, your vehicle. That's human. And maybe, uh, maybe there's something to that. Maybe not. Who knows? No, I agree. I think having, uh, first off, I'm a, a strong advocate of video and sound if possible video <laughs> over picture any day of the week. Uh, and just, you know, so many people go camping and they never think to put the camera on the vehicle or just leave it in the dash of the car pointing up through the windshield, you know, something. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think, you know, I'll get your opinion. <laughs> you're, you're the guest of the show. Why do you think people don't have any luck using trail cameras and recording devices like that do take video of getting evidence of these creatures. I love this question because I absolutely love this question because I think, um, I think there have been some really good uh, video and photos uh, taken. I just think people are really reluctant to share them. I've been, you know, I get, People complain and bitch and moan about, you know, symposiums and conferences. And I do speak at them. I'm not showboating. It, it's, it's nothing to do with it. I love talking about Sasquatch. That's it. I love the phenomena. And if someone gives me a platform, um, I don't make any money. Like, this is a fact. I, I, I don't go there and go, I need $5,000 or I need to, you know, no. I go there, you give me a platform, just give me a platform and I'll talk Sasquatch. And so I've seen a lot at a lot of these symposiums, these conferences, these uh, Sasquatch events, I've seen some <laughs> very compelling video in, cam uh, in, in camera shots uh, from game cameras. Not, not a whole lot, but enough that I'm like, wow. Um, and a lot of these people show up to these events and they just, they want someone to vet them or look at them or share them. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them don't want them out there for public consumption. Uh, that sucks, but it is what it is. Now, having said that, I also think that everybody's talking about, or everybody talks about all these trail cameras that are out there, you know, in the woods. Well, there are a lot of trail cameras out in the woods, but the vast majority of them are placed for two reasons, security and hunting. And when I'm, you know, I'm a hunter. Uh, when I place a trail camera for deer or black bear or cougar, I know where that quarry is going to be. I know they're going to travel this route. I know where they're going to be at certain times of the year. And I know what game... Uh, trails are using because there's game trails and so i place my cameras accordingly and that's 99 percent of your hunters and that place your game cameras they're placing them in known travel routes for their quarry deer elk bear cougar you have it um so i have it i do take issue because i think people are so arrogant to say that because there's all these trail cameras out there we should have you know more more video well that's saying that you know how Sasquatch travels. That's how they move. I, I can't claim that. I can't. All I can tell you is that I think, personally, do they use game trails occasionally? Sure. But do they travel through the thickest, nastiest stuff, which is reported time and time again? Yes. I, as a hunter, would not place my trail camera in the middle of a bunch of huckleberry bushes uh, hoping to capture a Sasquatch. Why? Because if I place my camera there, I'm counting on that Sasquatch moving through that huckleberry. But also, when the wind picks up, I'm going to have a thousand shots or videos of nothing but huckleberry bushes moving. Nobody in their right mind is going to place a camera where I think these things are really traversing and moving. And that's why I think there's a real lack of um, tracks, trackways, uh, like really good ones. Um, they're moving through some of the thickest, nastiest stuff to stay concealed. And that's where they're comfortable. They can ambush stuff. They can stay hidden. And so I, I really do believe it's, it's a little bit of arrogance when it comes to, you know, why, you know, why people always question why we don't have more game camera footage. I, I, don't, I think it's a no-brainer. I just don't think uh, you're moving for a moving needle in a haystack. And that haystack is thick. And it's moving through that. So that's just my thought process. But when I really started thinking about this, now, I don't know if Sasquatch 
can see IR and, you know, that comes off these cameras. I don't know. I don't know if the, you know, when, when it's looking at a camera, you know, they see that kind of fish eye, if that bothers them. I don't, I have no freaking idea. But when I look at sighting reports, like the ones where um, people are surprised, they're, they're fishing or they're hiking along a riverbed or a creek and they see a Sasquatch and they're like, Oh, there's a Sasquatch or a Sasquatch walks up on the person, whether they're hiking, bathing, swimming, whatever. And the Sasquatch is surprised. That got me thinking, because there's a lot of reports like that out there where they come across a Creek bed or a riverbed where both parties are surprised that either one's there. Um, or sometimes, you know, a Sasquatch is in the water doing its thing and it doesn't even recognize there's a person. There. Well, I thought, well, you know, I look at the Patterson Gimlin film, that was filmed along a creek bed. Um, how did Roger and, you know, Bob manage to sneak up on them? Was it because they're on a horse? You know, that sounded maybe like an ungulate, obviously, possibly. But those creek beds and those rivers, those moving bodies of water make sound. They make a lot of sound. They also cover a lot of smell because as the water's moving, you've got all this smell coming down these rivers and creeks. And so my uh, modem of thought is, that's where we need to place cameras is nearer to creek beds and rivers where it will not just mask the uh, sound of cameras, you know, that people, you know, some people claim that Sasquatch can hear the cameras. Maybe they can, uh, but also mask the smell of the cameras. There's a lot of smells coming down those creeks and rivers, but also rivers are a point of distraction. You know, you got moving water, you know, and so maybe just maybe, with all that distraction, that lack of smell, that lack of sound, that to me is going to be your best opportunity possibly to capture something on film. And so that's kind of how I've, I've been um, – I've moved my, my thought process with cameras, you know, uh, from different areas to creek beds and rivers. And I never strap them to a tree. I always put them in a stump or I kind of try to conceal them and hide them and uh, mask their smell. But that to me just makes sense. Will, will I be able to – get a Sasquatch on camera. I have no idea. I hope so. But I think if enough people start doing that in areas where they're comfortable placing a trail camera, um, we might, we might up the ante on getting something, you know, no proof Sasquatch exists, but something of significance rather than these silly videos you see on YouTube. And another huge, uh, key to that is these creeks are an opening where they have to come out of the cover, uh, to begin with, which is, you know, one of the huge problems with all these pictures and videos that we see where it's a bunch of trees and tree cover and brush and people are circling shadows and things like that where the big where the bigfoot can remain hidden if if they're on a creek bed they're going to have to come out into the opening and uh that's a key to getting a clear video or photograph i think I, I agree, completely agree. And like I said, well said. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a saying, I think it came from somewhere out your neck of the woods that Bigfoot follows the, the, the waterways or the you know, the rivers and creeks. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but they definitely have to consume water at some point and they definitely have to cross them at some point, I would assume. Um, what a great opportunity to, and, 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 not, and not, everything else fails you will have some cool footage of known animals. So yeah. it's a win-win. Have you ever experienced anything weird while out in the field? And by weird, I mean something that would fall into the realm of outside of flesh and blood Bigfoot or what you could explain away. Yeah. Um, quite honestly, Matt, I, I never have. Um, now Scotland, that's a different story. I've, they don't have many forests over there. Where I used to live was on a little island, and yeah, I I I, I guess went to some weird stuff, but just outside of stuff I could to I could explain or describe. But here stateside, when I'm in the woods or have been in the woods, no, I really haven't. Uh, I you know uh, people talk about orbs. Um, I have a good orb story. Uh, I I you know I don't discount that mm -hmm. just because I haven't seen it. Not far, I, I know too many people that claim to have seen orbs, um, you know, and so uh, maybe there's something to that. The only, there was, uh, years ago we were on a, a limb project expedition and we were going up this trail and it was around, I don't know, 1130 midnight or so. 
and out in the woods, there was this blue, it looked like a blue orb. And I was like, holy moly, people talk about these things. I've never seen one and there's one there. But, you know, I'm looking at this thing and it's not moving. It's just, it's stationary. Well, uh, eventually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the sort of person that will not just video it and take pictures of it. I'm going to go walk towards it. I got to figure out what it is. I have to. And so that's exactly what I did. When, when this group of us were out there, we saw this blue glowing thing in the woods. Um, I went down, down this ravine and up this hill and then down the ravine some more. It was a ways away. It was a good, oh, a good hundred yards away. And I get down to the base of the tree. I'm looking up. And what I saw was a, uh, it was blue. It was much dimmer than where I had seen it originally. But I realized that what I was looking at was a uh, fungal. It was mushroom. Yeah. And so I had, I had never, I still haven't seen another one to this day. And this was probably back in 2015. I've yet to see another uh, fungal uh, glowing thing like that ever. And so I went home. You know, after I figured out what it was and I told him, Hey, no, it's, it's, it's plant. It's, it's a fungal growth. I went back and realized that it was, it was something called Firefox. It's a, it's a mushroom that glows bioluminescent in the dark. And, but I went the extra step to figure out what it was. And so, you know, at the time, if I had just stayed there and videoed it, I, you know, it would have been anybody's guess. It could be anything. Uh, it's an orb, but it was, it was a fungal growth and I don't just scout discount whatsoever people seeing orbs maybe there's something to it um but you know i just always within safety within reason if you can figure it out get, you approach it and see what it is you know if you're comfortable doing that and you're, you're safe and not trying to put anybody in harm's way or anything but you know go the extra step and don't just doc you know video it and share it as an orb when in fact it may not be an orb but uh, and then if it is an orb and you approach it I don't know if an orb's going to, you know, unless it's a, you know, ball lightning or something, uh, I don't know if it's going to harm you. So, uh, it's just one of those things. Other than that, no, everything I've ever experienced in the woods, um, has been natural. At least as far as I know, I'm not experienced anything abnormal. And I spend literally, I'm in, I'm in the woods a couple times a week and sometimes longer than that, like every week for it in all types of weather. Uh, I'm a year around like many of us, like Chris Spencer and Todd Hill and Rebecca and Slick and many others. We're year round campers. We camp in the rain. We camp in the wind. We camp in the snow. We camp in the heat. Um, and I, I do, it's my passion. I love camping. Sasquatch aside, I just love to camp. Yeah. I had to wait on you to get back from camping like a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Jesus, yeah, sorry what is this that. guy doing? Living out in the woods? practically yeah. you know, i do kind you're, of you're in the woods and todd's at metallica concerts what's going on <laughs> i know i gotta give him some crap because he was uh he was supposed to be out in the woods with me that weekend but <laughs> you know he had uh, he's a he's a he's a metallica groupie so yeah he's a roadie yeah but uh no i, I I'm, I'm not experienced a whole lot and uh, as far as paranormal stuff and all that m my biggest my biggest uh complaint with that is when somebody and maybe they legitimately see an actual orb in the woods is why do they associate that with Sasquatch? Well, because that's, you know, a lot of in researchers and investigators, they're out there doing that research and then they see an orb and all of a sudden it's attached to Sasquatch when it may be a real orb, something weird, but what's it got to do with Sasquatch? I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is something to it. I don't believe so. But once again, I'm not so arrogant to say that I know everything because I don't know any, anything. And so it's just, you got to separate stuff, you know, categorize stuff and go, okay, well, that was weird. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. But when you're going out to the, the woods, you're going to hear a lot of weird sounds. You may experience some weird stuff, but you don't necessarily have to associate that with the Sasquatch phenomenon just because you're involved in the Sasquatch phenomenon. Yeah, I'm of the same opinion. Uh, and again, I don't know if they're connected or not. Uh I do know that a lot of witnesses that I talk to, uh, and this is including myself, it, have experienced different types of phenomenon during their life, uh, which to me seems kind of weird uh, in a lot of cases. Mm. But with that being said, if a deer hunter is out hunting in the woods and is like walking out to their tree stand before dawn 
and they see an orb, they don't think that the orb is attached to a deer. So why <laughs> yeah, do Bigfooters right. do it? it, it just uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten an answer yet, and uh, I'll let you know if I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please do. I would love to know, but that's a good analogy. <laughs> so do you want to talk about the Brown property? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I know you, I, I know you kind of had a thing going there. I don't know if you still are in communication with the Browns or anything, but it was a pretty interesting thing. What was, what was your take on the, the Brown property and what was going on there? I guess still is maybe, I don't know. Oh, definitely. It definitely still is. Uh, definitely still is. And I'm, I'm good friends with, uh, still, um, you know, we, you know, I won't lie. And, and Sarah and Johnson listen to this. They know it well, we, we kind of had a falling out years back, but, um, I got to tell you, um, I'm good friends with Sarah and Johnson now, and I got the utmost respect for them. Um, and they still have stuff going on on the property. You know, I've been very fortunate to be invited down to the property in the last, well, it's been a little while, but I've been, I'm invited down there and I had spent time down there with them. Um, I said, Johnson and Sarah are two top notch individuals that, uh, were very, <laughs> very lucky to absolutely, in my opinion, um, get video, um, to, you know, that video of a Sasquatch on, on therm. Phil Poling went there yeah, and did a lot of analysis on that thermal video. And like, you know, you're saying everybody that I talked to that has been to the property skeptic or not all agrees that that's a big foot on thermal. Yeah. Um, you know, David Ellis and Phil Poling did a fantastic job. You know, he was brought in, because he's, you know, kind of, he's a very skeptical guy and he does his due diligence. Yeah. Um, once again, another guy I have a lot of respect for, you know, he's, uh, I forget his YouTube channel, but he has a YouTube channel and he, he basically goes through very methodically and points to, you know, uh, videos that are very hoaxed or flawed. And then uh, occasionally he comes across something he cannot explain that he leaves open Yeah. and the Browns, you know, he's not coming out and saying the Browns thermal footage is absolute. No, I don't blame him. Who could? But I believe that is a Sasquatch they got on their their the thermal unit. And so they had they had haven't they've been having experiences on the property, um, including a sighting and uh, they got a hold of um, Derek Randall's originally and Derek put them in touch with David Ellis of the Olympic Project and so David started helping them out with audio, just recording audio on the property. And then eventually Derek, um, uh, loaned them one of our thermal units, um, a biocular thermal unit where they, you know, uh, Jonathan and his brother, uh, obtained video footage, uh, what, which I have no doubt is a Sasquatch. Uh, I've stood in that spot and Bill pulling and you can find this stuff online. I think through Salish, Sasquatch, which is Jonathan and Sarah's uh, um, YouTube channel. I, I think you can find it on there. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, it's, n I, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, yes, in the video, you see this figure, which is downside of a hill. It's, it's either standing or kneeling on the backside of this hill. And I've stood there. It's massive. And you do have cows. Uh, they have cows that roam this, this reservation. And you do have cows moving in front of the camera, of course you do, because there are cows in there and, and whatnot. But the the the, un, the individual itself, it's it's a very large individual. And, and the recreation done by David Ellis and uh, Tori Randalls, their wife actually stood in place as well. This thing's massive. You can see the pectorals, you can see the shoulders, you can see the head, um, and it ties in with also not just the the video footage, the thermal footage. But also the amount of recordings that Sarah and Jonathan were capturing on the property and the history in that area of this particular reservation is phenomenal. Um, and I, I was, like I said, I was I was very fortunate to have spent nights down there. Uh, you know, um, there was nights I'd spend down there and nothing would happen. There was one night, though, in particular, I was out with uh, Jonathan and his brother. Um, and, and it was after midnight and we were hiking back in that area where that thermal footage was taken, but then further back into the woods. And I had a, the same thermal unit on me that Jonathan and his brother had recorded this possible Sasquatch on. And I picked up a heat signature and not a big deal, but it looked like a head. It looked like a large round head. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out, okay, am I looking at a head? Am I looking at a large raccoon? 
uh, it was kind of low, but I, I'm looking at this thing and I'm starting to adjust the contrast on it. And um, it was massive, this possible head or whatever. It was massive. So I, um, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm viewing, I'm zooming in on this thing and I have Johnson and his brother behind me. When all of a sudden behind us, they have a creek that borders the, the back end of their property that's covered in brambles, uh, blackberry bushes. I mean, pretty gnarly. There's this huge splash. I mean, it, it sounded like an elephant had jumped into this creek. We all jump around. And as we jump around, we're, we're like, whoa, what the heck was that? And we're listening, we're listening, nothing. As I zoom back to where I picked up this heat signature, it's gone. It's gone. Huh. And... And uh, Jonathan noted before, you know, as we were walking up this trail, he had said, you know, hey, do you guys smell that? And it's something I often forget, but there was an absolute, uh, I'm not smelled it much, uh, it, very rarely, but this, this was stinky. There was a smell in the air. It smelled like nasty trash mm -hmm. um, that Jonathan had first picked up on. And I'm like, wow, you're right. Dude, this is stinky. So, that's just one of the experiences I've had on their property. Probably the most interesting one to me, um, having gone out there and spent the night investigated and went out. You know, once again, is that Sasquatch? I don't know. But it was just funny as I was getting my eyes on the therm on this end of this, this heat signature, there was this distractor, this possible distractor behind us that made this huge splash um, that scared the crap out of all of us. And we jumped around. And then, of course, when I turn around, uh, that heat signature is gone and you have the smell involved. Once again, was that a Sasquatch? I don't know, but that thermal footage they have to me is very compelling. Um, not just for the thermal footage itself, but based on the recreations and the, 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 the homework done on it, the, the size comparisons, the distance, uh, that's, that's how things should be shared publicly in general is you have to go back and do all the recreations to pretty much rule out everything as much as one can. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that was, that was a, a really fun time in my, my Sasquatch, uh, for, for Ray, <laughs> you know, that was a fun time and, and, um, very, once again, blessed to know Sarah and Jonathan and, and collaborate with them. We've, we've, uh, done a lot of stuff recently over the years. Um, and, uh, they're, they're still, they still have stuff happening on the property in adjacent areas. Uh, you know, maybe it's a matter of time before maybe they get something on therm. Who knows? Uh, again. Yeah. Phil's channel is the Para Breakdown channel. If anybody wants to check it out, he uh, does exactly that. Breaks down paranormal type videos, cryptid videos, everything out there. Kind of tries to get to the bottom of it and the truth. And, you know, like you're saying, uh, most of the time he figures it out or gives a possible explanation for things. But if he can't uh he says it you know uh if he thinks that something might be real he's willing to admit that as well uh i think he does a great job and has done a great job over the years yeah if i'm not mistaken matt i think he also helped barcatino out with his sierra footage yeah 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 and another great example where uh, uh you know another <laughs> Another great thermal footage piece that's out there for public consumption um, on Bart's uh, YouTube site, which it's not very active, but the documentation done for that thermal footage in the Sierras of California was phenomenal. And Phil pulling out a, a huge role in that and, and Bart reached out to, to Phil um, to get his uh, feelings on it and get his input and his expertise and, um, you know, left everything on the table to say, Hey, prove me wrong or, you know, not necessarily prove me right, but just, Hey, what are, what did I film? And, uh, so kudos to Phil pulling for being that guy and, and kudos to individuals like Bart that are unafraid and unabashed to reach out and go, Hey, um, here, I'll give you everything. Um, help me figure out what this is. So, and something that you talked about earlier and you know, here it is coming up again. Uh, a lot of times on the internet, you see a video or a photo and there's nothing else to it. It's just what you're looking at on the screen. But it's the collection of the documentation, the other things that went along, the full story surrounding the thing that can often strengthen or weaken that piece of evidence. 
And uh, Bart did an excellent job at, you know, trying to recreate it and, you know, recording all the information of the events that took place leading up to it and afterwards and the people that were there and where they were. And I, and then passed it on to Phil Poling, you know, uh, an unbiased uh, third party to review it and uh, see what he thought. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, um, my hats are off to to both parties there because Bart has nothing. He's one of the most honest people. He's a good friend of mine. We, we hang out about twice a year for different events, outings, and uh, just the most honest guy out there gets in it for the right reasons. And then to bring someone in like Phil Poling, who has a very skeptical eye, and will <laughs> if you're lying or hoaxing him, he's going to find out. <laughs> yeah. So you know you're, you're you're next on the line there. Uh, to to do that, I think is is so valid and so important. Um, and I think, quite well, honestly, I think there's a lot of people out there. I shouldn't say a lot of people. I think there there are folks out there that are sitting on stuff, uh, but they don't want the ridicule, you know. And, and and I'll I'll you know I can speak for myself personally. Where Derek Reynolds and I, um, 2000, I gotta get my dates right. 2015, I believe, maybe 2014. I could be off. I forget. Uh, obtained video footage of two individuals, two possible Sasquatch. Um, they were 350 yards plus away. Um, that uh, I found at the time. We were both looking through two different uh, thermal units. His recorded, mine didn't. But I was watching what he was seeing after he had found it after David Ellis was call blasting some sounds up this mountainside and a half hour in, we get these two individuals come down um, behind David and by a couple hundred yards or about 150 yards away. Um, but they were so far away that at first we thought they were elk, but we thought it was weird. The elk would approach the group. Uh, and uh, long story short is that I, I, you know, I, I, I think that these might've been Sasquatch, but it was so far away. You know, if I was to put that out there, Oh, Hey, Derek Randall's uh, of the Inland Project and myself got Sasquatch on on Therm. Here you go. People would eat us alive because it's not good enough. It's just not good enough. Is it a possibility? Sure. Absolutely. And we have gone back down and done comparisons where we found that the largest subject there was at least seven and a half feet tall. But it's still not good enough. And so the, I think not just DOP but other individuals, other groups out there have stuff, but they just know that it's – they don't care about the fame. They don't care about all that stuff. When they put something out, people should take it. Well, they shouldn't take it to the bank, but they should know that this group, this organization, this individual has gone to their most utmost to, to figure out what it was. And if they don't know and they think it's really cool, then share it. But don't share stuff, you know, like we don't and many others don't, where it's just not good enough. It's just – it's clickbait, Public or otherwise, uh, this could be something that you've seen privately uh, as much as you can say anyway. What's the most convincing piece of Bigfoot evidence that you've seen outside of the Patterson film? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, it's a tough one because there's just so much. There's just so much I've seen over the years. Um, well, quite honestly, I'm just going to tell you out there, I mean, just the stuff – the Alum project's been working on period. Uh, the nest area, like I stated before, is just, I moved up here. I was so enthralled, you know, I've been a hunter. I've been out avid outdoorsman for my whole life. And the nest area itself was so enthralling. And to hear this timber surveyor who had been at it for 27 years, um, come across these nests, you know, he, he's been out in the woods. He's, been doing his job for 27 years doing the same dang thing over and over again he comes across these ground nests uh, multiple you know not just one not just two but seven in one area it blew his mind well when i got to well, i was invited up there into the olympics to view these nests my mind was blown and i thought this is an absolutely amazing discovery and, you know, subsequently we've, we found hair that doesn't match anything up here. It's very primate like, uh, well, it is primate of some sorts. Um, and then, you know, the, the multiple impressions we found in this area, that to me is, and, and once again, I'm not showboating to me, to me, it's amazing. That's why I moved up here. I, I, 
I changed a lot of stuff in my life to move up here and, and thank God I have a wife that, you know, is from Oregon, but also uh, was willing to move up, up, you know, pick up our family and move because she believed in me believing in that this was something phenomenal. And I still believe that. And I know this. So the nest, the nest area itself is phenomenal. Um, you know, the, Paul Freeman, the Paul Freeman footage, you know, I used to be really 50, 50 on that. But since uh, his son has come out and written the book and Doug Hycheck has helped print that book. And I've seen a, a, a additional footage that looks like a little one held in the arms of the Sasquatch. That to me is phenomenal. Um, Cliff Berkman has some really cool uh, trail camera footage uh, that he obtained from some police officers in the Clackamas area where I had my encounter um, that I think is phenomenal. So, I mean, just as Cliff always says, Cliff Bergman always says, it's, it's not the one piece of the puzzle. It's the whole thing that really, that really brings everything together. If you look at just one piece, you can, you can throw that aside. But when you start looking at the bigger picture, everything captured, everything obtained, that's out there for the public and everybody else. It's amazing. So we live in a crazy time uh, where uh, news agencies and various governments around the world are openly talking about UFOs to an extent. Uh, You know, UFO disclosure is a huge thing. You've got uh, people involved in the intelligence community, uh, former intelligence officers, various, uh, members of the military all coming forward talking about these things do you think that that will ever happen with bigfoot well you know that's that's the big rabbit hole right i mean that's a big rabbit hole i mean obviously in the news today and it's gaining traction is all this ufo talk or what they call up up uap upis uaps thank you i'm not a i don't know the lingo uh, it's not my forte, but, um, <laughs> uh, I, it is quite the rabbit hole and I really try not to speculate on that, but I would be, I, 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 I would say I'd be amazed if there weren't certain factions of our government that weren't aware of Sasquatch. Cause if you look at like the border patrol, for example, who monitors, you know, both sides of the, this country. <laughs> Mexico and you know the can- Canadian side and whatnot. Uh, with all the stuff, the technology they have, and there's been many reports of the Border Patrol, many uh, of coming across Sasquatch or or something they couldn't explain that was bipedal, hairy, large. Um, there, there's got to be certain factions of the government that's aware of them. Now, I'm not going to get into why it's not been disclosed or why it's not been shared. I mean, that it could be as simple as they just don't care. Um, they don't want to bring attention to certain things. Who knows? But I would be a, a shocked if somebody at some level of our government weren't aware of these things. Uh, you know, and there's not a great con- – I don't think there's a huge conspiracy uh, as far as, you know, certain levels of the government. You know, I've worked alongside and talked to many park rangers and war- game wardens that are very intrigued. Because they've taken reports and or seen something, they're just not on that level. Above them, who knows? Who knows? Um, is it a possibility? I think right now we have a better chance of uh, them disclosing that you know UFOs are, are are a real thing than Sasquatch because it's just I don't know if they care enough. Um, and then as soon as that's disclosed, what what does that do if if if, if they know anything? What does that do to our national parks? What does that do to the timber industry? What does that do for anybody just going out in the outdoors? Because if somebody if somebody knew something and was to come out into the public and go, yep, Sasquatch are real, well, that opens Pandora's box because now you are claiming they're real, but unless you know anything about them, you'd be like the spotted owl. Oh, all of a sudden, we don't know how they breed, when they breed, where they eat, where they traverse, what environments they need to live in, they, have, they, don't, they would almost have to close uh, a lot of areas down to the public and to all these industries that make the United States money and, and these you know, uh, businesses money. Um, that would be detrimental to a lot of things. And so um, if you give that up, if you say, oh, yeah, Sasquatch is real, 
Uh, well, I mean, that's and then they're they're aware of it too, and that goes that goes alongside with the UFO thing. UFO thing. If they claim that they know UFOs are real, well, that means they've been sitting on it. And do you think the American public or the world's gonna just like you know bat an eye? No, they're they're gonna be pissed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the general public's already distrusting enough of the government. And exactly. <laughs> now you guys are admitting that you've been lying to us. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a nightmare. What a, like I said, Pandora's box. That's a rabbit hole. Uh, I assume they don't want to go down. It's just interesting because, you know, you, you do hear a lot of stories. And I, I've talked to some people that, like, I 100% believe are telling the truth that they have encountered uh strange interactions with government people out in the field uh looking for bigfoot where they've kind of been shut down on their research areas and things like that uh yeah. you know some some level of a cover up taking place but then you literally have the Patterson film you've got the nest site <laughs> which you know if they were trying to cover stuff up you guys would have been shut down from the get go it, it wouldn't have even made it to you guys like right and you guys have right. been re researching that area for years and releasing information and bringing in like professionals and everything else so why would they let that go on and then just shut down a researcher just blindly going into an area to look for bigfoot well yeah yeah no great points Matt great points you know, and once again, speaking to like conspiracies, I mean, this was a, you know, with the nest site in particular, this was an area where we were allowed in. I mean, we were invited in. We, we didn't discover these nests originally. We did discover more after the fact, but we were invited in there by a private timber company um, and invited in there. So there was, they weren't like holding out on us. Uh, they were actually the owner of this timber company. <laughs> it's a funny story, but he's very enthralled with the, 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 the nest. He, he wants to know more about him. He wants us to figure out what's going on. But his, his, uh, this timber owner, his brother had a sighting down in Oregon while elk hunting. He saw what he described as a orangutan in a field spring up and run away on two legs. And so, um, there, there, there is an interest in that, but there's no conspiracy. I mean, we're allowed into this area. We got keys to the gates. We're absolutely allowed into this area, but as you stated before, um, yeah, I've heard my, 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 I myself have heard stories of years of people being not allowed into certain areas after something has happened. So with the nests, I mean, either, you know, and I'm not absolutely stating these are Sasquatch nests. I can't, I didn't see a Sasquatch laying one. I didn't see a Sasquatch make one. I think Todd Hale and I in 2020 came across one that was in, well, it was in the making. I think we were very close to discover, you know, seeing what made this nest. But um, yeah, when it comes to the government or the factions that may know about Sasquatch and why they allow certain things or don't allow certain things, I don't know. It's it's a weird one. You know, it's a weird one. Maybe there's they just know something we don't know. So I understand that you left Scotland a long time ago, uh, but. You did spend time there. You probably know more about Scotland than I do, but I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> specifically, the UK. Uh, something that's happened uh, since you and I became part of the Bigfoot world is Bigfoot has become popular in the UK, and you have mm. researchers over there, and you have people putting out sighting reports of Bigfoot in the UK. What is your opinion? Is is Bigfoot really over there? Can it exist there? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I hope you don't lo lose listeners to listen to the show because it's fantastic. But uh, <laughs> it, hey, uh, your opinion, you can give whatever opinion you want. My opinion is uh, no, no, I, I don't believe it. I know, you know, and I don't get me wrong. I didn't live on mainland Scotland. I lived on a little island called Isla off the west coast of Scotland in the Hebrides. So it was, uh, there's definitely no Sasquatch on that island. <laughs> it's <laughs> very small island. It's known for its Scotch. But I have plenty of family. Um, I have an Uncle Andrew who lives out of Dundee in Scotland. He, he's hiked in Navis. I mean, he's been all around Scotland. You have reports of the Gray Man and, and other stuff. Um, I don't think it's even remotely feasible. 
I just don't. There's just not enough woods. Yeah, you got a lot of highlands and lowlands and and plenty of food sources, I guess. But I don't. I don't think it's even rem- the size of Scotland or or the UK in general. I mean, there's reports in Ireland, and I find ridiculous. But um, and and no offense to the. I know there's. Uh, I know a few uh, investigators and researchers that do that over there. Continue on with it. Prove me wrong, please. You know, I'm not saying I know everything because I don't. But I just, I don't think it's even feasible. I don't think it's possible uh, at all. I just don't. Uh, now, I do think there's a case for the big cats in Scotland. Um, and that's not even remotely ridiculous because the Romans, you know, they used to bring a lot of uh, exotic cats and animals to the UK. Sure. Uh, when they went. So, I mean, did a couple get loose? Uh, or, they, or are they just exotic pets from other people? Um, is there a population there? Possibly, but Sasquatch um, or a large hairy hominin, hominoid? I don't. I don't. I just don't see it. I don't think it's possible. But uh, prove me wrong. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. Have you ever had any experiences with the paranormal or anything like that? Um, <laughs> I've never shared this before, but I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, but it's it's got to do with the the. Uh, I'll just be first. I'll be first and fourth right here. I'm a Christian. Um, uh, my sisters, when we were growing up, used to claim a, uh, talk about dark shadows in in their bedroom at night. Dark shadows. Um, and there's some stuff I don't even want to get into because it's very personal with family, but um, mm-hmm. uh, very personal uh, with with my mom especially, specifically. But um, yeah, my sisters growing up used to you know talk about a dark shadow shadow darker than the, the room itself and we used to sleep with lights out grew up rather poor so we did, we, we tried to save electricity but they used to claim they, they would see dark shadows and yeah there was I mean that I guess I'll, I'll claim as a possibility uh, but um, when, when my mom had our house blessed uh, all that stopped when she became a Christian it all stopped it literally stopped and we never seen anything since so I remember um, in Scotland doing a, a Ouija board one time, the first time I've ever done one, and the only time I've ever done one, was a Ouija board. And uh, these individuals that I was with, young kids, young lads and lassies, whatnot, but they put this Ouija board out, and I never done one. I didn't know anything about it. And the thing, the gla- I saw the glass move by itself. There was no tricks to it. And as soon as I saw that, I was done. <laughs> I just, yeah. I walked away. I've never messed with one since. I don't open those doors to just, yeah. There, there, there are certain things out there. I can't explain. There are certain things out there that I don't want to mess with. And that's why I stick with Sasquatch because I, I do believe it's terrestrial. It's a, a living, breathing uh, thing. You know, people get mad when I say animal. Call it an animal. Call it a whatever you want. It's real. That's all I claim. I don't know what Sasquatch is. I definitely believe it's a sort of primate of some sorts. Uh, where that goes, I don't know. I don't care. They're real. Um, but I, I don't mess with any of that other stuff. And I think... That's why a lot of times um, when people open doors or open their mind up to other things or possibilities, yeah, you know, you, you might see what you want to see or you don't want to see. Uh, but I, I sleep comfy in the woods at night. I really do. I can go out to the woods by myself right now. And the worst thing I have to fear is the weather or a possible bear coming to my camp. Um, I don't fear the woods. I, I respect the woods. I respect the animals. I respect my environment because I'm, I can get hurt. I can, uh, fall to certain things, but it's just, it's respect. It's not a fear. And when you get past the fear of the dark, which is a huge thing for a lot of people, the dark people fear the dark because it's not our natural environment. But if you just accept the dark, uh, now I sound like Batman, I guess, (laughs) but if you accept the dark and, and just, and comfortable in the dark um, and, and get to know everything that transpires in the dark with known animals, you actually, uh, you'll fit in quite well. Uh, there's nothing to really fear if you respect it and know your limitations. So uh, I hope that answers your question. I kind of went off the rail there. No, absolutely. Uh, we rely very heavily on sight, uh, at least the majority of the population. And whenever you limit that or start to take that away, it gets very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And most people 
don't spend enough time in those environments to learn them and adjust to them and adapt to them uh, in a way that you're talking about and that you've done. Yeah, no, I mean, and it, you know, like I said, again, I'm not showboating. It's just, I do go out of my way to spend and, and not just myself, many others, um, even within the Olympic project, Chris Spencer and Chris Spencer will tell you, he's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he, he gets afraid. He does, but he's gotten, because he's spent enough time in the woods and uh, gotten to know the animals in the area and, and the weather patterns and the, the, the areas he's in, he's, he's night and day from when I first met him, but it's just being comfortable. It's uh, about just, you know, realizing that, yeah, yeah, things can happen, but at the same time, understanding what could happen and understanding what you would do in that, in that scenario, but also just experiencing the woods. It is some of the most peaceful things you can do. It's just spend night, nights out in the woods and in the dark. Um, it's actually, it's, it's awesome. Um, so, um, you know, but you got to respect the woods. You got to respect the animals, you know, uh, you got to respect everything. So th- there should be a healthy fear, but not uh, to the point where, you know, you're so fearful that uh, everything is Sasquatch or everything's this or that. You, you got to be comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, then try to get comfortable, try to relax, try to figure it out. If not, then you probably have no business being in the woods. You mentioned the uh, big cats of the UK, uh, you know, the black cats and everything. Are there other cryptids besides those and Bigfoot that are on the table for you? Well, the big cats, I mean, I think there's a, you know, I won't say 100% that they're, they're real or not, but I think there's a good possibility there's some exotic pets been let loose in the UK. Um, I, I still believe that the Nessie, Loch Ness Monster, is a possibility. They just found recently, so, which I've been talking about for years, um, that I thought was a possibility, and it was proven true, that there's underground caverns and caves um, around Loch Ness. So that's, Nessie's definitely a possibility. Um, you know, um, oh man, I'm trying to think of the one that, uh, well, Cadborosaurus, Caddy, off, which when it comes to water cryptids or, you know, especially in the ocean, all bets are off. I mean, there's so <laughs> much stuff we haven't discovered out there. It's shocking. Um, but one of the ones I've always been really fascinated with, I don't do research on it, but I follow is Cadborosaurus or Caddy, which is supposed to be off the coast of Western, um, in the Western United States from like, say like the Frisco area of California up through Alaska, many sightings, Many reports, um, there's a famous photo from, gosh, I don't even want to claim when. It was 1940s, shoot, uh, I don't know, 1930s to 1960s, I forget, somewhere within that time frame of whale hunters that cut open a whale that they had called, and they cut it open, and there was this long serpentine animal, which fit Caddy's description. So... And many reports of Cadborosaurus. So that one fascinates me. I think there's a huge possibility that that's a, a, a true thing. I mean, and then you look at like Lake Champlain. Uh, there's just a lot. The water cryptids in general fascinate me. So I think there's, like I said, a, a huge possibility that, and obviously we've not discovered everything in the ocean. Uh, it's barely been explored when you look at the scheme of things. So that's what's fascinating to me. But then, um, like the Oran Pendic that uh, Cliff Berkman has been looking into and, and Adam Davis and, and others, um, that's a real possibility. Um, there's a lot in Africa and, and even South America that I think we've yet to discover, um, even larger species outside of like the smaller amphibians and, and ma- mammals. I mean, there's a lot to be discovered. Um, I mean, even the Yeti. Uh, the Yeti, for example, could be, who knows what, but it, I think there's a possibility that there's something to that. You know, that was one of my first loves in Scotland was the Yeti. I just reading the stories about the Yeti, uh, the mapping uh, is another one, um, that I think is really interesting out of South America. Um, so, and then there's ones, you know, that, uh, we'll never hear of. I mean, you look at Papua New Guinea, all the amount of cryptids that are supposedly living in the ocean around there, let alone in the inner jungles, uh, like the Ropin, you know, that uh, 
It's apparently like a sort of pterodactyl or pteranodon that has bioluminescence. Um, that one fascinates me because the, the natives talk about it, you know, and that's something I think, you know, kind of a side rail discussion here is that, you know, in 2017, um, the uh, Tapanuli orangutan was discovered in uh, Indonesia. Uh, I forget what Sumatra or whatnot, that general area it was discovered. And that's a, basically an orangutan species, a new great ape species discovered in that area, 2017. That's just a couple of years ago. I mean, when, when you think about it. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, North America is by far, uh, specifically the United States, the leader <laughs> in cryptid exploration. <laughs> and then you're naming off all these places. And I'm just thinking like, yeah, South America, Africa, you know, Asia, like all these like huge, vast expanses of wilderness that like nobody's even researching really. Like, no, exactly. You have very small, limited expeditions that usually come from the UK or the United States that go there. Or you have like uh, some company that's like clear cutting forest, you know, for the timber industry. And maybe they run across something, but they're probably not going to tell you if they do because then that shuts down their operation and they lose money. So uh, there's a lot of area that's really untapped whenever it comes to the possibility of cryptids and that's not even beginning to talk about oceans <laughs> that take up the majority of the planet <laughs> yeah yeah you know it, it just goes i mean once again i think people in general even academia science are so arrogant in their assumptions and their belief systems they get stuck in these ruts where they they think this is the way it should be because that's what the textbook says or but textbooks are changed daily. If you look at the hominid, I mean, just look how many different fossils are finding around the world right now from all parts of the world that are, uh, you know, not, you know, non-human primate to, to, uh, you know, um, supposedly, uh, human like, you know, all that stuff. I mean, it's amazing when you look at the lineage and the tree line, how, how diverse it is as, as Dr. Meldrum always says, you know, it, they used to think it was more like a tree. Now, it's more like a bush. All these different intricacies when it comes to life. And so when it comes to exploration, as you stated, Matt, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a number of researchers out there, uh, individuals, groups. I mean, and, and no offense to any of them. I think a lot of them are doing great stuff, and some of them are doing better than, than most. But how? what are they actually doing? You know, I always, I always point my finger at myself first. What are we doing? That's why I don't go out and try to bust hoaxers or and whatnot. I'm like, what am I doing? What am I bringing to, to the forefront? What am I, how am I researching? How's the Alumba project researching? I, and so, uh, but I think the vast majority of people are, you know, they can't spend the time. They don't have the money. They can't spend the time out there because the day jobs, which is everybody. And uh, how much, how much actual what is one classify as research? You know, I mean, the research word gets tossed around. Researcher word gets tossed around. Um, you know, and if you just pay attention to Facebook or social media, you're probably going to hear everything you want to hear, but there'll be no substance to it. So, um, it, it, it is a it's a it, it is a one of those scenarios where um, I think we're just scratching the surface with this phenomena, even though we've been at it for a while. You know, go back to the Patterson human film and longer. We're, we've just scratched the surface and maybe in my lifetime we'll just dig a little deeper within what we're doing, but maybe uh, nothing will come from it. I don't know, but it's uh, it's fun. So with that being said, what's your personal goal in this journey? Are, are you trying to be the guy that proves it or prove it for yourself? What, what do you hope your legacy will be after it's all said and done? Oh, well, good question again. Uh, no, uh, Sasquatch was proven to exist for me a long time ago. That's not even on my radar. Um, I know Sasquatch to exist. Um, my, my personal goal, uh, honestly, is just to collect as much data on something I know to exist. I just want to understand it. I just want to understand the species. Uh, I just want to understand them. I want to collect data on them. I want to know where they go, why they go, how they go. 
you know, all of those questions. And then I want to, uh, as I stated before, collect as much data on them. You know, I mean, I'm always picking up, not always, but quite occasionally we're picking up some really unique stuff that, you know, sh shifts and shapes my opinion on their behavior or what they're doing. Um, so, and that's all in-house stuff. I mean, it's nothing I would come out and say definitively to the public. Oh, they do this. No, that, that'd be ridiculous. If I, for me to claim, I know anything about Sasquatch would be stupid because I don't, I have my opinions on my ideas. I have my beliefs. Um, and I'm working on making them concrete. That's all I can do at the end of the day. And that's all the unlimited project can do. And that's all we're trying to do is a catalog as much data as we can on something we, as a group, for the most of us, know to exist. And so am I trying to prove it? Am I going to be the one to prove it? Chances are, hell no. I probably won't prove Sasquatch exists in my lifetime. Probably not going to happen. Um, but um, I do want to do the subject matter justice. Knowing that these exist, knowing that Sasquatch is a real living, breathing entity, a real uh, thing out there. I want to, uh, I want to do it justice because that's, I've taken on this endeavor and I want to see it through. I won't be one of those guys that, uh, nor would the Olympic project as a whole, be one of those groups or individuals that, uh, that are disappear. Uh, we're in for the long haul. We're in for the long run. I think once again, we've just scratched the surface. We're building on the shoulders of giants. And by that, I mean, your John Bender Noggles, your John Mindzinski's, your Grubber Krantz's, your Renee Hinden's, your Dr. Meldrum. Those guys have put a lot of their academic career on the line. Your Peter Byrne, uh, though not an academic per se, he was one of the four horsemen that just passed away recently. And so those guys, I'm staying on their shoulders because they laid the foundation. I need to do, I need to build upon that and do them justice. And that's my goal, and that's the Olympic Project goal. Um, so that, that at the end of the day, um, you know, hopefully we can bring something to the table of substance and not hearsay um, that we vet our evidence and, and thoughts and hypotheses and ideas to the point where science cannot look away anymore. Monster X Radio, what's going on, man? Yeah, <laughs> I've been slacking on that. Uh, <laughs> You know, thank God for uh, people like Julie Ranch um, and Thomas Steinberg who have been doing a show called "Staying on the Shoulders <laughs> of Giants." <laughs> yeah. So they, they've been uh, they've been uh, filling in the void. I've just been so busy with life, work, family, uh, and that honestly, I've been spending so much time in the woods, uh, in different areas, three of our main areas. That um, to uh, I'm I'll be honest with you, Matt. I'm very anal about. Uh, about the monster X because if I put out a show and I know, you know, this more than well, um, when I first start gone into podcasting, I would never edit. And I go back and listen to those shows and I cringe, I cringe because <laughs> they're the worst. I mean, you know, you're talking off your cell phone and, but, and there's no editing and it's just, they just sound, I mean, great content in a lot of cases, but they sound horrible. So nowadays, you know, I got, I got my whole little setup. I have to edit the shows um, and I edit myself. You know, I don't have help and I'm just, it's just, it's time consuming and I want it to be, I want people to enjoy the show. I want people to listen to it and go, okay. Or, you know, I don't want them complaining. Oh man, you already sucked or this or that. No, it's, it's, you know, and so I'm, yeah, I've got shows lined up. Chris Venture and I, I think have so much to cover uh, and so much to share. Uh, I want to talk to Todd Hill and Rebecca, the people I get out in the woods with the most, um, that I think have a lot to share that I respect. Um, they'll be coming down the road here. It's just a matter of, uh, sit my butt down and recording and editing and, and then sharing so that people can actually enjoy it without going cringing and, and having to adjust their, you know, if they're driving in their car, adjust their sound because their screeches are, you know, <laughs> Oh, uh, the woes of a Bigfoot podcaster. I do know it well. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> well, how can someone reach you if they want to reach the amazing Shane Corson? Well, minus the amazing part, I think, you know, if they want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm, I'm on usual uh, uh, social media sites. I'm on Instagram at, you know, uh, 
Twitch. I forget what I'm called. I don't even know. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Just look up Shane Corson. If you get lost, just type in Shane Corson Bigfoot. I'm sure I'll pop up. Um, or uh, you can email me at Shane Corson at MSN.com um, if, if you feel so free. Um, or, you know, get a hold of us on our webpage, um, you know, uh, alumproject.com. That's a good way to get a hold of me or any of the other Olympic Project members that are, you know, amazing people. So, yeah, um, I'm glad, uh, glad to have been on the show, Matt. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, long overdue. You know, I'm, I'm so glad we were able to line up the schedules and make it happen, man. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I look forward to many more conversations in the future. And if you've had an encounter with Bigfoot or something you can't explain and you'd like to share it on the Bigfoot Crossroads podcast, shoot me an email at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. If you get a chance, check out the website, bigfootcrossroads.com. You can find links to social media, past episodes, links to the merchandise, everything you need, all in one place. And until next time, remember, there's something in the woods. Oh,